Beep, 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 beep. Welcome to the court of the EDI Jester. It's so good to see you again. So good to be speaking to you again. How can I see you? Madness. So good to be speaking to you again. Oh, we ought to have an EDI Jester conference, I've decided, and get everybody together. Have some speakers. Should we do that? I wish. Right, so, what have I got for you today? Well, uh, right, there's Nutmeg on Twitter, right? Many of you will know Nutmeg. Excellent researcher, digs out stuff um, and then distributes really good, you know, a lot up with Tish and, and the lies they tell in researching the nonsense and how far it can go of the um, critical social justice nonsense, nutters. But this is a beauty, right? This is an absolute beauty. So I thought I'm, it's 98 pages long. I am not going to read out the 98 pages. I'm not going to analyse every paragraph, but I thought I'd give you a flavour and I'll put the link in the Dubris to Nutmeg's original tweet. Uh, so that if you want to go and have a look at the actual document itself, you can do. Um, and I suggest if you want to have a look that you do before they take it down, because this is beautiful. Now, some of you may or may not know that I have worked. I worked for the civil service for years. I've worked to, uh, you know, DEFRA, uh, the driving DVLA and uh, HMRC, um, DWP. Home office. I taught them for years. And when I was teaching them years ago, because there's going to be a bit of this up, Nutmeg, are you listening? There's a bit of this I'm going to disagree with you on. Oh, the horror. Right. So when, when I was teaching them years ago, I used to have to teach them recruitment skills. And I, so this course that they had, it was what was called civil service learning. It was a terrible course, right? Because first off, it was, a, it, was, it was a one and a half day course. Who does that? Right? One and a half day course. And after that, they were supposed to be able to recruit. Just insane just insane it's the same nonsense as when they you get corporate trainers give them a give them a flip chart and a penny be all right <laughs> it's that same nonsense right so what nutmeg has said in the tweet is that this is what's now going on a new 98 page guide for uk healthcare ceos and hr directors so this is this is the top this is up here right in the nhs or for healthcare um to support trans staff with a forward 98 pages with a forward from the NHS Confederation CEO provides recommendations, including sending interview questions to them in advance as the process might intimidate them. Right, so first things first, this is the NHS, not the civil service, but you know, like trying to, you know, put a carrot between a particularly tight pair of bum cheeks sometimes, especially when it comes to the learning. So nutmeg, interesting, you may find this interesting. They've always done it ever since they introduced the civil service. And I'm going back a good 15 years now, maybe more. They've always done it. They've always done it. And they did it off the back of people said that it was unfair to expect, expect people to have to ask questions in an interview without knowing what the answers might be. And when they got themselves tied up, as, as, as the socialist bureaucracies always do, with, with what the answer to the competency question was telling them. So what they did was they, they said, look, you know, uh, we, we won't use professional people who know how to recruit and, can, and work on their feet when somebody answers a competency-based question, what we'll do is we'll give them the competency-based question first, then we'll make a whole bank of answers, then we'll have people judge those. So in trying to save money by not training people to be proper recruiters, they built a bureaucracy around it so big it cost them more money than if they just got proper recruiters to do it in the first place. This is so typical of the socialist state that is the NHS and the civil service. So, I'm, it, so to begin with, that make, I, the, I don't know whether the NHS did, but the N civil service certainly did. They... They would always give them the answers before. Um, so this LGBTQ plus leaders network, NHS Confederation, leading for all, supporting trans and non-binary staff healthcare, but a non-binary healthcare staff. If I find out there's any trans and non-binary healthcare staff working in a hospital, I'd be very, very worried about that hospital, especially non-binary. It's not, it's not a thing, right? So there's a forward from Matthew Taylor, um, who, as far as I'm aware, and certainly some of the responses to this forward in the on the tweets. Um, it was a man of great integrity, one of the greatest minds of their generation, somebody said. So it says here, the healthcare sector aims to be inclusive for all, but for all its progress towards inclusivity, there are still vulnerable, vulnerable groups of its workforce that are left on the peripheries. Vulnerable groups of its workforce. Hang on a minute. I'm not quite sure what that means. If somebody is vulnerable, that, isn't that a legal term to be classed as a vulnerable adult? So they're, they're either an adult who is not vulnerable or they're someone who is vulnerable, in which case that's, I don't know. I'm very confused by that opening statement. Do you understand it? Put it in the dubris, because I don't. The healthcare sector aims to be inclusive for all. 
but all its progress towards inclusivity, there are still vulnerable groups of its workforce that are left on the peripheries. What does that mean? They're paid to do a job. Can they do the job? Yes. All is well in the world. Can they do the job? No. Why? What do they need to help them do the job? Can they do the job? Have they been helped? Yes. Can they do the job? No. Goodbye. Thank you for playing. I don't understand the opening paragraph. Have a look and let me know what you think. Two successive NHS staff surveys have shown that trans and non-binary people face a disproportionate amount of bullying and harassment from both staff and service users, with trans people being the most likely to face physical violence from not only the people they care for, but their colleagues too. Are you telling me, Matthew Taylor, that you've got people in, your, in the NHS who are beating up people because of how they dress or because they think there's something they're not? And they're being beaten up in the workplace. I'm sorry, I'm finding this really hard to believe. So what you're saying is there, the survey has said that trans people being the most likely to face physical violence from colleagues. Well, first, my question is going to be, how many of these colleagues have been, have been handed into the police, please? How many of these colleagues have been handed into the police? Are you telling me that people who work in the NHS are beating up other people who work in the NHS? Because that's what it strikes me as you're saying here. Again, put it in the doobris. Do you think that's what's being said? Healthcare leaders have told us they want the tools and insight necessary to ensure they can be effective and active allies to the trans and non-binary staff. Well, I don't even know what that means, and I would be very, very cautious about doing it. The fact that somebody's trans or non-binary gives them no elevation at all above anybody else. In fact, in the case of the nonsense of non-binary, it can be dismissed out of hand. They must still be treated fairly in the workplace, but you cannot expect any other worker to play along with trans and non-binary fantasies. You simply can't do it. So what exactly is the purpose of this 98-page document? How many people paid to do it and how much time was wasted? How much public money has been spent on this? When you can't say at the beginning here that there's been violence towards these people. I want to know how many of the staff were instantly dismissed for beating up trans and non-binary people, how many were referred to the police, and how many prosecutions have been successful. Please give me those details, Matthew Taylor. Health healthcare leaders have told us they want the tools and insight to ensure that... Healthcare leaders shouldn't be fannying about with other people's fantasies. They treat everybody with equality. As under the Equality Act, they tolerate people's beliefs. It does not give them the right to play them out. And it certainly doesn't give people the right to play their fetish and their paraphilia out in the workplace. And if somebody's mad enough to think they're non-binary, I'd be very worried about them being in a medical position indeed. Very worried about that. If they have the inability and are so intent upon dehumanising themselves that they attempt to opt out of what it means to be human and you want them caring for others. That's a red flag to me, Matthew Taylor. I am aware that this report comes at a time when public discussion around trans and non-binary identities is heated and divisive. It doesn't matter. What, so what? If a group of people, a group of people identified as bunny rabbits, you can take the piss out of them. Identities have got nothing to do with it. What is this man thinking? He's at the head of the NHS Confederation. What are you thinking, Matthew? However, we should not forget that every single member of the healthcare workforce deserves a safe and supporting work environment. Yes, safe from a health and safety perspective, supportive in that they are supported to do their job. It is not your job to take place in, to take part in social engineering so that people that do not believe in these ridiculous gender identity queer theory bull are forced to do so because you give senior leaders the tools and insight to enforce it. Oh, I hope that this, ga this guide goes some way to achieving that. Matthew Taylor, um, you're a spider, mate. You're at the heart of it. You're a spider. It's not rare. It's rare we see you come scuttling out from the centre of the web, but you are a spider. OK, so to add just the one bit that sort of struck me, because it's all in there for you to have a look at in the Dubris, but the one bit that struck me, um, uh, accessible interviews. So for the marginalised and minoritised communities, uh, shut up. Everybody's treated the same. 
for trans and non-binary applicants, interview panels can be intimidating. Well, if perhaps if they stopped being lunatics, it wouldn't be. If they are, via, if they are visibly transgender, right, how are you visibly non-binary? If they are visibly transgender, applicants may be concerned that the, piano will, that the panel will react with hostility or even be discriminatory due to their appearance. If I was on a panel that was interviewing somebody and I got one whiff of I'm getting off on having these knickers on or I'm a fetishist or a paraphiliac and I'm dressing this way because it gives me a, a euphoria boner. If I had one whiff of that, they'd be out of the inter room, interview room faster than you could say Jack Robinson. Differentiate, Matthew. Tell us. What do you mean by trans? Do it. That should be in there. That should be in there. That should be the first thing you say. Right? So you exclude the eunuchs? What about drag queens? Somebody turns up dressed as a drag queen for an interview. You're going to be all right with that? How do you differentiate between the drag queen and the LARPing bloke? Apart from the professionalism in regards to makeup. How do you? <laughs> really? You know? Even for trans and non-binary people who can be stealth or pass. I mean, all non-binary people are stealth or pass because there's nothing to tell you that they are. They're just making it up. It's just, it's a, not, it's a nonsense. It's like saying they're Father Christmas. And apparently they've got a glossary for more information. Go and have a look, folks. Tell me about the glossary. I'm going to leave that one to you. And then it says, allowing applicants to prepare for the interview by giving them access to the questions beforehand. This may seem counterintuitive. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely counterintuitive. So what you're saying is that you want to give one group of people, the non-binaries, who are just fantasists, along with another group of people who are either unwell or fetishist paraphiliacs or confused youngsters. And you want to elevate them above everybody else by giving them the questions beforehand so that they can get the job roles and then become the activists in your midst. Matthew, I think you have many questions to answer. And, and it was interesting to see the amount, the amount of respect that you've garnered from people in the tweet originally put up by Nutmeg. It sounds to me like you're somebody who has fallen. And I'm sure that my jesterites would like to know whether that's true. You have a look at the Dubris. Have a look at the link. Let me know what you think. All right. You can always put it in the comments here or you can put it up on Twitter. Share this to Twitter. Let's get a conversation going around this because it's a 98 page document and it's relevant to HR directors and CS CEOs, which is important because it's up there in terms of the healthcare hierarchy. So share this from YouTube. Go and have a look at the full document. Get the full document link onto Twitter. Ask other people to have a look. Let's find out what's going on. What does Net Nutmeg actually uncovered here? But let's most of all recognize that trans and non binary identities are a falsity based on an individual's belief system. And you do not have to play along. Be respectful, be tolerant, but don't play along. Um, interesting one, this. Please go and do some work. Share. Let's get the conversation going. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Bye.